welcome to Sparky's Tour Time. And we are continuing uh, in the book of Leviticus. My name is Rebecca Liebes, and I'm coming to you from San Diego, California. And we are studying Torah. And why? Why do we study Torah? Because the Torah connects the New Testament with the roots and the foundation of our faith. And if you don't know Torah, then you don't fully understand the New Testament and everything the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, came to do. So this is our organic class, we call it, meaning that you can join us at any time. And this is the book that we use. It's called A Year Through the Torah for Christians, and you can get it on Amazon. So today, we are finishing up in the book of Vaikra, which is Leviticus. And we have a double portion today. We have Bahar and Behuchotai. Uh, it's a lot. I'm going to finish it off today with a story having to do with the Jubilee year. So I hope you'll listen to it. Uh, you may have to do it in two sessions. Maybe listen for 45 minutes the first time and then the second time get the second portion. So. Um, let's get started and let's take a peek into God's word and a deep dive into his Torah. So I'm going to share my screen now and we'll get started. So here we go. So we're in Leviticus, as I said, chapter 25, 1 through 26, 2. And then we're going to tie it into the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament in the book of Luke. For those of you who don't have the workbook yet, um, may I suggest each week that um, you look on First Fruits of Zion and you can find the Torah portions listed there and you'll know where we are in the cycle. And um, we pretty much stick with where they are in their cycle. Um, the cycle is somewhat different around the world, the different scriptures that people are using. Um, but if you want to jump in and you don't have a workbook, just go to First Fruits of Zion, click on Torah portions, and you'll see what part of the scripture we're in. And you can join us, read ahead, and um, still enjoy this teaching. So what is Bahar? So Bahar is a um, word that means on the mountain. And um, it's the mountain of Mount Sinai. I'm going to move myself over here so you can see the screen. There. Um, on the mountain is uh, where God spoke to Moses and to Israel. And in this portion, he's giving her his final words before um, she moves on. And it's like a, a bridegroom pleading with his bride to be faithful. And they're really words of love. And he wants to bless his bride. He wants to bless Israel with abundance and many blessings. And I love that the fact that the word har is mountain. And it's also the root word of hara, which means to make pregnant. So when Israel meets with her groom, Adonai, he wants to give her something for her future. And that's where I'm going with this. Um, making a bride a mother uh, gives her children. And this story is about God wanting to take care of his bride, bless his bride, and give her abundance when it comes to uh, children. And of course, in the spiritual realm, this is spiritual children as well. So this would require what he is asking of his bride is a period of rest. Now we're all in that period right now, aren't we, where we're resting. And I think you're going to see some very um, parallel things happening with Israel and where we are in our culture right now. So this time of blessing would require that they let the land rest. And um, 
since their year always began on Rosh Hashanah, they were to let it rest every seventh year. So they would start counting from the seventh month and they would count seven cycles of seven years. Each seventh year would be called a Shemitah. And a Shemitah means to release. It's a word meaning a, a release. It means to let go. Uh, it also means to fall from a height. In other words, it's um, like a dropping. Um, so it's uh, a time when God is asking the people to let everything rest. They weren't to work the land. They weren't to farm it. They were just to cease working in the land and let it rest. And the whole point of letting the land rest was to renew it. Of course, it's nutrients and everything else. So after counting these seven cycles of seven years, or this is where you get the word sabbatical. It comes from Sabbath. So seven cycles of seven years or sabbatical years. The 10th day of the seventh month in the 50th year, it's to be a year of freedom called the Yovel. And the Yovel is the year of Jubilee. This is where you get the word Jubilee from this word Yovel. And Yovel means to bring home, to bring everything that has been lost, stolen, sold, taken from you. Um, you get to receive it back. And on Yom Kippur of the Yovel, the loud blast of the shofar would be heard to proclaim liberty. So this year of the Yovel, or the year of Jubilee, was a year, every 50th would be a year of Jubilee. I wanted to show you uh, the word shofar. It means to be harmonious, balanced, to unify elements, and to proclaim. So the blowing of the shofar was symbolic in that God was waking people up, that this is the time to stop everything, to let the land rest, let the people rest, and let things be rejuvenated. And also this, there's another word that's related to shofar, it's sefer. It's the syllabants, both the, the shin and the samic are syllabants, and they have a whistling sound when you say them through your teeth. So they're like sound alikes, they're phonetic sound alikes. But a sefer means to combine elements or to count. It's also the word for sapphire or something very, very valuable. Uh, in the Talmud, um, when Moses went to the top of Mount Sinai, they say that the first set of tablets were actually engraved by the finger of God on tablets of sapphire. So it's like this beautiful picture of a bride and groom and these words all relating to each other that he's trying to create balance, harmony, uh, bringing things together uh, for the good of the whole. And so this is the theme of these um, two parasha are to have the bride obey and then reap the blessings of this period. So the Yovel is also the name for a ram or an animal of transport. So isn't it interesting that it's also the name of a ram? A ram means, um, comes from the word rum. Rum means to raise up, exalt. So the blowing of the ram's horn is um, almost like the Lord is, is saying, I will be exalted. Pay attention, people. I have blessings coming. This is a time for you. So the sages, Hazal, say that the Yovel was mentioned four times in this parasha. Israel had three times of being redeemed, called the Geulah, where they were taken off into captivity and brought back. Well, the rabbis believe that they're still in a, a form of exile, and they believe that when the Messiah comes, that it'll be this fourth Yovel, or the final um, coming home, where the Messiah will redeem the land, 
all things will be at peace and at rest. So this is just what they're waiting for right now. So the rabbis also relate the final jubilee with uh, something in the prophet of Jeremiah in chapter 17, 8. And this is what it says. This special year will be like a tree planted near streams of water who sends out its roots by the stream. It's the same root word. Yubal is the same word as yovel means a stream, something that goes out on behalf of the land. So you can see how a stream would water the land and, and give it what it needs. Well, the Yovel or the Jubilee would also give the people what they needed most. Um, I think there's nothing more beautiful than when uh, a husband realizes how tired his wife is and he cooks dinner or he takes the kids out so she can have a day for herself. Um, it's much needed uh, when there's a lot going on in the house. And it's, it's a way to show love, isn't it? To give your bride rest. So um, it, it says it will be sent forth roots by a stream and it does not notice when drought comes and its leaves are luxuriant. It is not anxious for the year of drought, but keeps on yielding fruit. So the whole point in having this time of rest is to be fruitful so that as things are rejuvenated and nourished, then the coming cycle would be abundant and uh, yield fruit. So the prophets call this Jubilee year like a tree that is well grounded and always producing fruit. And it says this person planted by the tree, nation, Israel, would be unaffected by the heat, by famine, by wind, worry, fear, oppression, or persecution. And they say that the throne of glory will be exalted from the beginning. And ultimately, God will be glorified when the people around the nation of Israel. See that as they obey the one true God, that they will stand out among the other people. And that's also one of the uh, motivations for God to have this period is so that the people can rest, but also that the name of Adonai would be exalted. In John 4, 10 in the New Testament, Yeshua met a woman at the well and she asked uh, for water. And um, Jesus answered the woman at the well and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, he asked her for a drink. And then he, she asked him, well, where can I get this water, living water? And he responded and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So here's the Messiah in the New Testament saying to this woman, um, where can I get this living water? And he said, it comes through me. In other words, follow me and you'll always have plenty. You'll have abundant fruit. Your life will be blessed. So Jesus was also referring to himself there as the living water. So the year of the Yovel, the 50th year, is one of the greatest messianic signs. And the rabbis see this word Yovel in Psalm 149.3, relating to the Messiah. And here's what they say. With the drum and harp, let us make music unto him. They're talking about the Messiah. So here it is in Hebrew. And here is the four letters of the word Yovel. Yod, Vav, Bet and Lamed, Yovel. So the first letters of each of these words are used in this word. And it's a time of great joy and freedom. So these special Yovel years, the 50th year, is a time to celebrate. They would have these huge celebrations. And there'd be plenty of food for everyone. And we will talk about that more as we move through this. Jesus also compared his kingdom to planting a tree. 
by streams of water. So the roots would be sent forth. Again, it's the word yabal. So see, to be sent forth, to produce water like a stream, and to call freedom and jubilee, all have, are all related. So it all has to do with taking you somewhere, uh, moving you forward for more production. Someone who trusts an Adam and Adonai will be known by their continual production of fruit at the right season, in the right place, rooted near water. And right now, the Torah and God's word is like water. He says, my words fall like rain. And that's where we get our rivers. So when we're well watered, we have good root. If we have good root, we have good shoot. If we have good shoot, then we produce good fruit. So that's an agricultural principle, isn't it? So what happens in this year, this 50th year of Jubilee? All slaves are released or redeemed. So let's say you had a, a relative or a brother who was sold because he couldn't afford to pay somebody back in money. So he said, I'll work for you for so many years as your bond servant. Um, in the year of Jubilee, then the relative could come and redeem him with silver. And so the land was restored to the original uh, lawful owner. All debts were forgiven. It truly was a year of liberation. If you look up the word liberty in this scripture in Leviticus, it's the word darar, and it means to return home. So darar shares its root with another word that I think it's important to look at right here with some Hebrew grammar. This word darar shares two of the letters, the dalet and the resh, dalet, resh, resh, and returning home is related to the word for generation. So there's a prophetic hint here. All people were um, allowed to eat from the food that the land produced during this 50th year. So slaves, poor people, everyone could come and eat from the fields. And uh, it was a time when everyone had more than enough. And this included the owner and its family. So they would eat together. So there was no um, higher, lower. There was no slave or free. Everything was totally equal. Everyone had this unity as well as liberty. And there was enough for everyone. And usually, if you were blessed, a typical life during um, this time was 120 years, but uh, if you didn't live that long due to famine or uh, disease or whatever reason, usually a jubilee year was only realized once in a generation. So that's why this word liberty and generation are related because it's something that you only experience once in a lifetime. Now, this peace and enough for everyone and everybody at rest and at peace with one another, doesn't that sound like the time when the Messiah would come? You can see why the rabbis relate the final uh, redemption and geulah to when the Messiah returns. So in Vayikra 2520, the scripture says, if you ask, if you can't sow or harvest during the Jubilee year, what are we gonna eat? Then I will order my blessing on you during the sixth year so that the land will bring forth enough fruit for all three years. So every seventh year was a Shemitah. And they're like, well, what are we going to eat if we can't farm for a whole year? What God would do is he'd provide extra in the sixth year that would take them through the sixth, seventh, and eighth year. Then after seven cycles of that, by the 50th year, they would have so much grain, so much stored up, that it, that it even says in the Talmud and in the scriptures that they had to throw out the old to make enough room for the new, the blessing, the abundance. And I think that's a message for us right now. Uh, we're all at home resting. 
um, we're all equal. We're all in this together. And I believe God is doing something supernatural right now. And I believe that we will see his fingerprints all over this time. When we look forward and look back on this time, we'll see God had his hand in this. And we'll see that through it, people's priorities have changed. Um, how we see one another, hopefully, will change for the good. Um, how we share with one another, how we look out for our fellow man. And uh, it's very Jewish to say, I am my brother's keeper. So um, I think we can learn a lot through this and, and uh, revive some of that um, brotherly love that we so desperately need during this time. So those who were wealthy and didn't want to obey this jubilee, they couldn't wait for it to be over. And they griped about it. And this new year would end, this, Shem this Shemitah or the Jubilee would end after that year. And the year always began on Rosh Kodesh in the seventh year. And it was the new moon. And so that's how they told time. When they saw the slightest little sliver of a new moon, they would blow the shofar, two people would witness it, blow the shofar, and it would be the new month. And so they couldn't wait for Rosh Kodesh, the sighting of the moon, so they could sell their produce. And this is, to me, a picture of those that have a lot. Um, they have disregard of anything that has to do with God and his cycle and his calendar. And it's all about me. And they have worldly desires and worldly priorities. I think we also see that in our world right now. The haves and the have-nots, um, those that mock and make light of those who want to follow God and his ways. Uh, there's always a mocker around when God is about to do something high and holy. I always share that with my, um, with my class when I teach because you'll see it. You'll see those that want to do it God's way and then you'll have those that want to change things to fit their own agenda in their own ways. And then the Christians get mocked. And we see it today more than ever. Look at Amos 8.5. And here's what the prophet Amos had to say about the people during this time. When will the Rosh Kodesh be over so we can market our grain and the Sabbaths so we can sell our wheat? You measure the grain with unequal measures so you can cheat others. This is because they used price gouging in uneven scales and were taking advantage of the weaker. And um, we see a lot of that in our culture today where um, people are used to paying high prices for things that probably aren't really valued that high, but because of mismanagement, of money, mismanagement of our desires, um, budgets, family budgets are almost a thing of the past where people just get out their credit card and spend, 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 and then um, states are doing that. I don't want to get into politics, but you can see that, that God had a plan for order to bring about times of abundance, times where you would store, times when you'd be generous, times when you would withhold from things. It, it's what King Solomon talked about in Ecclesiastes. There's a time for everything under heaven, right? A time to plant, a time to sow. To everything, turn, turn, turn. That was in the 60s, right? Look at James 5, 4, and he refers to this in the New Testament, he says, the wages you have fraudulently withheld from the workers are crying out against you. You have led a life of luxury and self-indulgence. Oh my goodness, if that's not us. In a time of slaughter, meaning there's needs from other people, you have gone on eating for yourself. I call that the me first mentality. Things done that are wrong, things that are unjust today in our culture. Sometimes you think, God, where are you? Look what's happening in our country. Where are you? What are you doing? How come you're allowing this? But just know this, God sees. 
and he knows what's going on and he's totally in control as he was bringing a whole nation of millions of people out of Egypt. He brought Pharaoh down. He can lift up and he can bring down. He can lift up presidents. He can bring them down. He puts people in place for specific times and reasons. And I have full confidence that he is totally in control right now. Therefore, we as a church can be like those trees planted by streams of water where we can have abundance in our words that are positive, that are reassuring, that speak words of faith and life to other people instead of worry and despair and um, being anxious about tomorrow. Jesus warned us against that. He said not to be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough worries of its own, but just trust him day by day. So things that are wrong, God's going to make right, and uh, it's going to happen by two ways. Number one, the prayer of the faithful people, and number two, his perfect timing. I've always paid attention to timing of things. Think about this. Without time, faith is impossible. Think about that. Without time, faith is impossible. In other words, you need a period of time to go by in order for that faith to be walked out, and then you hope for whatever it is that you're having faith in, whether it's faith in the coming of the Messiah or faith in that God is going to find a job for you or he's going to give you children or give you the love of your life, whatever it is, um, God is a perfect father, a loving father, who also has a perfect timing for everything. Remember when Jesus said, for you, any time is right? So prayer, timing. So uh, pray, San Diego. Pray, people all over the world. And pray for our leaders. Pray for those in authority. Pray for our policemen, for our military, for our president. Uh, yes, whether you're Democratic or Republican, pray for those leading our country right now, because it affects all of us. So the Lord will redeem the land and the people. And once again, he will get glory for his name and the mockers will be silenced in the end. So um, I, I always just smile and I go, oh, be careful little man with your dust fist in God's face. There are consequences for that kind of an attitude. We see it all through history and all through the Bible. So God wants to bring glory to his name, not so that, you know, we can all bow down to some distant uh, deity, but he wants a relationship with us where he can show us his faithfulness as a husband and as a, a loving father um, to his children. And so he wants to get glory. And glory just means he wants honor for all things that he has done for us. That word honor is kavod, and it means to be weighty, and it is also the word for liver. Liver is the uh, heaviest organ in the body, and look what it does. It supplies nutrients, and it filters out impurities. Oh my goodness, isn't that what the glory of God is all about? As we obey, he nourishes us, and he filters out impurities that would come against us and harm us. This is exactly how God works. Isn't it funny? I noticed that the word liver has the word live. You can't live without the live-er. Okay, that's just me being silly. Okay, if we look around at our current culture, we can compare it to this land that he wants to rest. See, if, if you don't let the land rest, it's, it's what it's called abusing the soil. Uh, or um, making it less in its value. And again, that can be compared to our culture. Um, we've been abusing our culture by uh, tearing each other down, by undervaluing things that really matter, um, by creating value on things that are uh, overvalued, such as, in my opinion, this is just mine, you know, paying athletes, you know, millions of dollars and those that are sustaining our culture like teachers, nurses, uh, are paid minimal. I, I'm like, it's upside down. 
but now that everybody's sick, oh, let's have flyovers and let's all praise the teachers and the nurses. And isn't it funny how things change as soon as everybody gets uncomfortable? I always just smile and go, oh, Lord, forgive us. We're all so foolish. So just like in agriculture, if you lose the good soil or you lose the good topsoil, I call that truth in our culture, uh, it leads to a gradual erosion and the nutrients are washed away. And I see that happening in our culture. And I compare it to uh, deception and uh, apathy and egos and me first. And it, it's like our country is eroding and the topsoil is being washed away. The things that matter, the things that made us a nation and made us great, um, like our morals, um, how we value human life, uh, how we don't dispose of the weak, um, all those things, or what, how God established our country. And so erosion comes, I believe, when also there's no deep-rooted trees. Now think about that. When floods come and there's no deep-rooted foliage, you have mudslides and people are just washed away. Um, so to me, that is a picture of deep-rooted people. Deep-rooted people hold on to the soil. Deep-rooted people hold on to truth. They hold on to things that matter. And they cause stability in the culture. People that uh, live the truth of how, what, how God wants to lead our nation. And there's plenty of water, but if there's no deep roots, even... Um, the soil will be washed away, even though there's lots of water, if there's no deep rooted people. So I believe that. So in this parasha, God has provided a way for Israel to return, to be redeemed and to be brought home to reclaim their land. And he said, please, please, please be obedient. Please, I'm begging you. I'm begging you for your own good. Do what I ask. Be faithful to me. And you'll have continual feast of things. You know, there's three words that I find interesting in Hebrew. One is nahal. It means a stream or a river. And it means to flow downward. And it means an inheritance. So a river represents what's coming to bring us life uh, and it's coming from a mountain doesn't it now look at this other word for stream to stream forth look at this word i'm going to increase this this is the word har right here that's the word for mountain and this is the symbol and it's ancient symbol it's the sperm or a seedling or new life so a, to stream forth is the word for a river, Nahar, because it's the life coming from the mountain. Isn't that beautiful? And then the third word is Yuval, and it's a stream. A Yuval is a stream, and it goes forward, and it leads to something larger. So it's a stream that leads to like a large body of water. So all of these have to do with an inheritance, something better, moving you forward, a blessing coming, larger blessings, greater blessings. Um, all these pictures are here in this word jubilee. Here it is, yaval, to send forward to something larger. So pay attention in the 50th year. So let's see, where am I here? All right. The Jubilee year functions like this river. It's leading the people to experience something greater, awaiting inheritance, a time of rest, refreshment, restoring land, people, bringing back the natural order of things. The me first mentality is dismantled during this time and replaced with there's enough for everybody. And I believe that that's a time that our nation 
right now could be focusing on during this time of rest when everybody's staying home, nobody's working. We're letting the land rest. There's enough honor, enough love, respect, kindness, patience with one another. These are all things we could be learning during this time. That might be something we all can be praying about. Lord, what are you trying to show us? What am I lacking? What do I need to throw out so that you can provide me with more abundance? What do I need to get rid of to make room for what's coming that's new, that wants to fill my storehouse, my soul, my spirit? That's the year of Jubilee. So let me move on here. I already did that slide and that one. Okay. So look in the New Testament in John 17, 21. Yeshua prayed and he said, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they also be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. So the Messiah is praying for that same oneness where there'd be peace and those that follow him would experience an abundant life. And Jesus is praying to his father and he's saying, you sent me, we're one. Now I came to make them one, Jew and Gentile alike. So how are we one when we follow the Messiah? We're one in will. My heart wants what he wants. We're one in the same truth, in his word. We're one in our walk, on how we walk out our lives, how we uh, walk it out in front of the world, and then in his ways, to denounce things that are of our own agenda and um, have a desire for what's on his heart. So maybe during this time, um, get on your face. Have you ever done that? Have you ever got on your knees and just laid flat and prayed with your arms stretched out? like some of the saints of old have done. I've done that. And it's a, a time of humbling. It's a time of submission. And it's a time of being serious with the Lord and just saying, Lord, forgive us. Lord, help us. Lord, show us what we need to do to be more like your son, Jesus. Show us, Father. And I believe it's that kind of heart and attitude that God's waiting to see in his people and in our nation. Look at Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water. Now, I want to show you uh, in the Hebrew, this word, um, someone will be blessed if they don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. Wicked means those who are broken and they just don't want to do it God's way. They want to do it their own way. So think of wicked like that. I'm doing my own thing. So blessed is the man who doesn't walk in this kind of counsel. And look at the word. It's etza. So counsel has to do with a tree. Etz. See this? This is the Hebrew for a tree. This is the counsel of the wicked. Now remember what happened in the garden. They ate from the wrong tree, the tree of the knowledge between good and evil, between what's right and wrong. And so that tree represented where they were getting their counsel from. So when they ate from the counsel of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's right here in Psalm 1. It says, blessed is the man who doesn't basically eat from that tree. And he'll be like one planted by streams of water. Now, this word stream is totally different. It's peleg right here in Psalm 1. Peleg means it will create a division. There's a stream that, that cuts through something and creates division. So when you follow God's way, don't be surprised when you're like that stream that causes a division. When you're faithful to... Um, be planted by that kind of a stream, there will be division. And Jesus warned against that also in the New Testament. He said, if you're not willing to lose mother, father, sibling, brother for my sake, um, then 
you can't follow me. So you have to be willing to lose your life, your agenda, your will, in order to follow him and say yes to him and say, Lord, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So look at this word for etza, counsel, etz tree. It's also the word, the root word, sharing for bone. And what is bone? Bone is where we store power in our marrow. So look, when it says, when you follow the Messiah, the Messiah and his word, it'll be like a sword that divides bone from marrow. In other words, the things on the outside from what really gives you your power, which is the spirit of God in me. So you see how they're all related, which, where are you getting your counsel? What is your backbone? Are you going to stand up even if it causes division? Um, are you going to let God's Holy Spirit be like the marrow that gives me my power? Where I move in his power instead of my own? This is where prayer comes in, church, where we pray for God's will to be done, and we pray that he would give his people power and that he would, his name would be glorified in this time. So, church is called god's calling us to have a backbone right now to stand up straight to have your voice be heard during a time of mocking and division so because of that one tree we were given stored power the holy spirit he died so that he said when i leave i'm going to leave you the counselor the holy spirit and he said that would give you the power to walk out your faith. So being religious isn't enough, people. It's never gonna, it's never gonna give you what you need to follow God with your whole heart. You'll be double-minded. Uh, you'll be this way on a Monday and this way on a Friday. Uh, you have to say yes. You have to be willing to leave your will behind and say, no matter what, I will follow you. Boy, I've I've had to give up of things in my life, um, in my past. Uh, for me, it, it was giving up uh, someone I loved very much uh, because I was in a different place than, than they were. And uh, it was painful. But my prayer was that I would um, follow Jesus first. And hopefully then that person would one day experience um, a glorified uh, God. That he would see that I followed the God that loves me the most. And hopefully then this person would also uh, come to realize that he was also very much loved by the Father. And then the second thing that I had to give up for God's sake was a child and uh, I had adopted a baby and the mother took him back after a week and uh, she left went to Mexico uh, she came back a week later gave the baby back to me I was so thrilled after losing five of my own I was just desperate for a baby and she gave him back and I, I was just praising the Lord. I just thought that was the greatest thing God had ever done in my life. Two months later, she came back a second time and took him from me. And I could have kept him. I had a very powerful attorney that was willing to fight for me. And he was going to make her look unstable. And uh, I went up to L.A. to get this attorney, and he said, oh, we're going to make her look really bad, and then you're going to get the baby. Well, it was what I wanted most. And God spoke to me, and he said, give the baby back. I have something for you. It's not my timing. And that was the most difficult thing that I had to do, was to not only give her the baby, but God said, when someone asks to go a mile, go two. So I gave her bags full of clothes and diapers and toys. And I was left with an empty room and an empty heart, wondering, where were you, God, when all this was going on? And yet, I have two wonderful sons today that have been my double portion to trust him during those times when you give things up 
that are painful, um, God is faithful to bless you when you're obedient. And so if there's anyone out there like w ready to give up when you've been waiting for something you've longed for, trust God. I want to encourage you today. Trust him. Let him show you how real he is. He wants to give you faith that's strong, like a good backbone. Trust him. He's faithful. He really is. So Jesus said, I am the Aleph Tav, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And if you look in the scripture, you'll see this tree of life in the Garden of Eden and a tree of life once again in the very last book of the Revelation. And you'll see a tree and it says it's standing in the middle of a river coming out from the throne of God. It's all a picture of our inheritance coming as a blessing when we are in the final Geula, the final Jubilee with the Lord. It, it's such a beautiful picture. And because of his willingness to die on a tree and give us new life, um, because of his willingness to do that for us, he is so worth following and, uh, and experiencing that sweet relationship with him as we trust him. Look at Revelation twenty two fourteen. How blessed are those who've washed their robes, in other words, clothed in the righteousness that's given to us through the Messiah, so that they have the right to eat from the tree of life and live forever. And that's what we'll be doing. Uh, we'll be eating from the right tree when we end up in the eternal year of Jubilee. So when Messiah returns, it'll be that final beautiful time of celebration and joy. And it'll be like the time when mankind was given the garden and everything was in its pristine, perfect condition. There was unity and oneness. Uh, we're seeing right now uh, a time of jubilee uh, for Israel when they returned as a nation back to their homeland. And um, the 14th of May uh, was Israel's 70th birthday in 2018. So actually, um, she is 72 uh, this May. And um, she celebrated uh, a Shemitah, uh, a celebration uh, two years ago. And uh, it was in 1948 that Israel became a nation again, and it was a type of jubilee, a coming home. It was so beautiful to see um, videos and movies of planes flying in from Russia and Poland, all over the world, God's people returning to their land and getting off planes and getting down on their knees and, and kissing the ground. So this was uh, Israel's Independence Day just uh, a day ago. So that's how this parasha of Bahar ends. And we start this next parasha. And I'm going to go quickly through this. And I'm going to end with a story. Um, so we'll be covering um, Leviticus 26 through the very end of this book. We will be done with the book of Leviticus or Vayikra. And next uh, Saturday, we'll start the book of Numbers or Bamidbar in Hebrew. So what is this one about? This is about what God is asking his bride to do that seems beyond human reason. Ahok is um, a verb, hocha, this is what, what's in the center of this title. Ahocha means to draw or portray. It means to engrave or inscribe. It also means an ordinance. And it's something that we do that God asks us to do that we don't understand why, yet we do it out of obedience. And so this whole portion of scripture here is talking about God's mitzvah, his judgments, um, the things that we do in his name as a testimony. And some of it we understand and some we don't. We just do it out of plain old obedience. And um, God is teaching us by keeping these ordinances and laws and mitzvot that um, it's like training wheels on our faith walk. 
Um, look at the word keep, like if, if God says to keep his commands, his hoax, his, uh, mish, his mishpatim, his judgments. It's the word shamar. Now, keeping and shamar mean to guard or protect. So when we say we're keeping God's commandments or keeping his Torah, what that means is that we're guarding it or protecting it. It's like God has made his people guardians of the truth, guardians of his word. And so this is a covenant relationship between bride and, and, and bridegroom, where you, you make each other uh, a blessing because you're obedient to do what you know the other person is asking you to do. So in a covenant, there's responsibilities and there's restrictions, isn't there? So, I mean, if you're married, you can't go off and dance with another man. Um, so there's responsibilities and restrictions. So it means be a guardian of something. And in this case, he's asking Israel to be a guardian of his ways, basically. And that's why we let our light shine. When Jesus gave the Beatitudes, he said, let your light shine before men. In other words, do what's right before men to glorify my Father in heaven, but also so that men would um, benefit from doing what's right. And the only way we can do that is by being regenerated, by being regened, by giving us that Holy Spirit. My will wants my own way. But when God filled me with his Holy Spirit, July 11th, 1973, I was a different person immediately. It was like somebody took glasses, like going to a movie and seeing things in, you know, two dimensions. And then you put those 3D glasses on and you're like this, wow, everything looks different. That's exactly what happened to me in an instant. I was right in front of uh, the LAX airport driving in my car, and it was like God poured out his Holy Spirit over me. It felt like warm honey coming over my body. That's the only way I can explain it to people. And like somebody put 3D glasses on me. And I knew from that moment on I would never be the same. And I wasn't. And I said, Lord, I'm going to follow you the rest of my life, whatever that means, whatever it takes, whatever you ask. And I've tried to live my life like that. Um, but when we obey, even though we don't want to sometimes, it's like the more we do it, then pretty soon he begins to change our hearts as we're obedient. And it's like how we train our kids, isn't it? The more you say, okay, get up, it's Sunday, we're going to church. Pretty soon by the time you're 17, 18, that's your habit. Yeah, my family just gets up and goes to church on Sunday. Um, so when they when we train children while they're young, it's like they're training wheels of their faith. And um, I, I noticed this in my Christian walk. There were times I did things that I didn't really really want to do, but I knew God was asking me to do them. Um, one of them was uh, when I was in the hospital with my bowel obstruction. There was a lady in the bed next to me, and she was in her 90s and had no one. And long story short, I ended up praying with her and she prayed to ask Jesus into her life. And I said, I will come visit you every week while you're alive. And I did. <laughs> every week I went to the nursing home where she went. And there were days I didn't want to drive up to Carlsbad. And I dragged myself there. And I, and I said, Lord, just use me today in some way. And do you know what? I don't have time to tell you the stories. Maybe I will another time. Um, but all the blessings that came when I was obedient surprised me. I went out of obedience, not always wanting to, but wanting to make his name great. I didn't want to say, have her ever say, oh, yeah, that Christian, she said she'd come every week. Well, it's been two weeks. Where is she? Um, I didn't want to disgrace his name. So I was faithful, and I'm not saying that to lift myself up in any way, just as an example of, you know, even when our hearts aren't right in things, and we do them because we love him, and we want to please him more than we want to please ourselves, that's what he's looking for. It's called kavanah, the intention of our heart. So for those of you who God is asking you to do something, you don't really feel like doing it, do it anyway. There's a blessing that'll surprise you. So studying Torah is about God providing 
uh, a certain rhythm and tone in our life. And, and he's begging his bride to follow him no matter what, no matter what it feels like. And this is called halakha, walking out your faith and doing it in a way that will glorify God. And basically, that's what this whole parasha is about. And let me talk about Matthew 7, 24. Everyone, therefore, who hears these words of mine and does them, walks them out, he will be like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. The rain came down, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, but it didn't fall because it was founded on the rock. Again, it's a picture of something that's stable, like a tree that has deep roots. Being on a rock, same, same principle. And that ties into the New Testament. So we studied the Torah to see Jesus all throughout it and then understand the words that he said would trigger thoughts back to this time when God was trying to steer Israel into a certain land, a land that would bring her peace and ultimately peace from all her enemies. And um, we're longing for the day when he returns. Israel ignored those Shemitahs, by the way, and didn't let the land rest. And there were 10 cycles in ancient Israel where they, they didn't stop and let the land rest every seventh year. That total of 70 years was exactly the amount of time that Israel was taken into exile in Babylon. So he's warning his bride not to fall away. He's begging her to be faithful. And he's saying, please do it my way because it'll bring ultimately uh, peace in your life. There's an expression in Hebrew, and I'm going to end with this. Psalm 17, 8 says, keep me as the apple of your eye. You know, when, when you're in love with somebody, they say, oh, he's the apple of my eye. That means I have face-to-face -face intimacy. You're the one I focus on all the time. And they call that the ishon bat ayin, and it means the little man in the eye. In other words, when my focus is on the one I love most, I should be able to see myself in his eyes because that's where my focus is. And it's called the apple or the round part, the pupil of the eye, is I, I need to be so focused that I could see myself as a little person in his eyes. I think that's beautiful. So he's saying, keep your eyes on me, people. I give you power. I give you provision. And it's me that gives you approval. So don't look for man for approval. Look for God's approval. So he's worth it. He is my strength, my worth, and my song when I focus on him. So mazel tov, chavarim. You have completed the book of Leviticus, the one that we used to dread reading sometimes as Christian has become uh, one of the richest for me. And so here's what the Jewish people say when they finish a book uh, of the Torah. They put their scripture down, they put their Torah scroll down, and they walk around it seven times. And they say, Hazach, Hazach, Venit Hazach, be strong, be strong, and may we all be strengthened. And that's my prayer for all of us. So pray, church, watch for God's timing, be strong, and may we all be strengthened. Now, I'm going to end this time together, and I'm going to tell you my Jubilee story. And I might edit this and separate it uh, from this teaching, but I'm going to continue to tell it now. And I may just post it as Rebecca's Jubilee. How about that? I'll put it on Sparky's Torah Time. But let me tell you my Jubilee story. This is a fun story. I have to start my story by saying that when Israel became a nation, May 14th, 1948, Great Britain had been in control of Israel. And when they became a nation, 
they were released from the control of Great Britain and they were declared their own nation for the first time. As the British officers left and boarded the warships in the harbor, Israel heard only one lone bagpipe playing. Now imagine, it's their year, first day of freedom, and they hear one blow of a bagpipe. If that isn't a jubilee, picture of release and freedom and the blowing of the shofar, that happened when the state of Israel, on, a, on his first day of freedom, it was like that blowing of the shofar, a signal for a time of jubilee. Well, now that you know about this bagpipe and what happened with Israel, I'll tell you my story. So it was my 50th birthday, and it was my year to what I used to call jubilize. So I go, oh, I can't wait to turn 50. Don't you know that 50 is the year of jubilee? And so myself, my mother and father, and three of my four siblings, we all went to our hometown in Marquette, Michigan. It was the celebration of the 150th anniversary of our town. And to celebrate, Marquette, Michigan decided to hold an all-class reunion. And so my older sister, who was seven years older, my other sister, six years older, my brother, three years older, myself, my mom and dad, we all went home. It was going to be a homecoming of all of us. And so we met in Marquette, Michigan, and here was our house. Here was our home on 501 East Arch Street. And we lived right on a corner, one block from Lake Superior. We loved this home. It was the most beautiful Queen Anne home. It was 100 years old, over 100 years old when we bought it. It had a sun porch here, and um, it had a third floor, and a basement, and a front stairway, and a back stairway four bathrooms, four fireplaces. It was just beautiful home. When we left this home, uh, I was 18 years old. And it was a very sad time for our family. Uh, my father had lost his job and had taken a job in Florida. And for me, I was a cheerleader all through junior high and high school. And my senior year of high school, I was at a party prior to homecoming and had a couple beers and I uh, went to homecoming with alcohol on my breath and I was kicked off of the cheerleading squad. And as a punishment, I had to go sit at every game in my regular clothes and watch the other cheerleaders and be humiliated with my father sitting beside me. So. At this time, it was Christmas, and our family was grieving. My father, my mother, my siblings, and myself. And we had to say goodbye to this beautiful home. And I had to leave all my friends. These are kids I grew up with from third grade. I moved away and graduated with 1,200 kids that I didn't know. Talk about a lonely and sad time. Well, God is all about redeeming our sadness and redeeming uh, his children when they're faithful. So in this time of a 150-year celebration, we all decided, since it was my 50th birthday, we were going to go back to Marquette and reclaim our family land and just attend this celebration. So we all went together. And we went and um, here was the beautiful Lake Superior. Uh, this was the lighthouse. We lived one block from here. And at night when I'd go to bed, I could hear this foghorn from this red lighthouse. It's a famous lighthouse in Upper Michigan. And I'd go to sleep and hear boom every night. And it was just the most glorious time in my childhood. And so it was, a, it was a fun time for all of us to go home and go to the lighthouse and go to our house and, and see all old friends, etc. Well, here's the fun story. Along the harbor, the town to celebrate had these totem poles and all these families would make totem poles and buy a hole in the ground and a totem pole and decorate. 
So I said to my siblings, I know, let's surprise mom and dad and we'll make a totem pole for the Leewalds for 501 East Arch. So my sisters and I had all these pictures that we had brought to share with one another. So we blew them all up of our house, our pets, um, the fraternity house across the street from us. And we painted this quickly in one day, we created this totem pole. And we surprised my parents with this totem pole. And we had my mother's favorite lilacs on the top in our dress. And you can't see it here, but we had pictures all over it. I'm going to show you in a minute. And so we said to my mom and dad, let's go down to the uh, harbor and look at everybody's totem poles. And my dad bought ice cream cones for everybody. And so we were walking along, totem pole, totem pole, totem pole. Well, after about 30 of those, my dad was getting tired. He was 85. He's like, oh, I don't want to see any more totem poles. Well, we're like two totem poles from ours. And we're going, oh, no, no, dad, come on, let's just watch a couple more. So my mother's like, no, dad's tired and it's hot. We're, you know, kids, come on, you know, let's just go sit in the shade. We're like, no, just two more, mom, two more. So they agreed to two more. So we just couldn't wait. We had cameras rolling. And here's my mother. When we said, oh, my gosh, mother, look, dad, look a totem pole for the Leewalds 501 East Arch. All of the years of sadness were redeemed in this one picture of my mother's face. She started crying. This is my brother-in-law, Al Halverson. And my mother's crying. My dad is crying. We're all crying. And it was like we came and we set up this totem pole and we said, the Leewalds will be remembered. Even though we left in great sadness, we returned in a jubilee. It was my jubilee year. We were so excited as a family. And here's me. Look at the joy. And this is my dad, and he's pointing out everything, my, the ore docks, my mother's art room, and, and my sisters, and, and all of us. And it was just a time of total celebration and jubilee. And um, this is all of us taking our picture. Uh, we were all brought home. There's no place like going home to somewhere you love. And so this was a picture of all of us when in my 50th year. And uh, what a time of rejoicing that was. And so the best part of this story, well, it's not the best part, but a fun ending to this story is when we finished um, the totem pole and this wonderful time in Marquette, uh, my dad and I were walking along and we were walking along down by the harbor and we're walking along and as we walked along the lake shore, there was one lone bagpipe playing and he was playing Amazing Grace. So this was my dad who had left Marquette humiliated, me humiliated, and us returning arm in arm around each other. And what do we hear? My favorite, favorite thing in my year of Jubilee one lone bagpipe playing Amazing Grace right by the harbor, one block from our house. And I just couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, it's my Jubilee and they're playing my favorite thing. When I was single in LA, I had an album that I would put on with Amazing Grace and bagpipes. And everyone in my building said, oh my gosh, Rebecca's got her Amazing Grace bagpipes going again. But when I heard that, it was so personal for me. God is so good and so personal. It was just like when that bagpipe was playing in the year of Jubilee in Israel. So here's the end of the story, and, and this is the fun part as well. We finished uh, our time in Marquette, and we drove to Battle Creek, Michigan, where my sister Linda lived, and we said, well, let's go to lunch at the Cracker Barrel restaurant. So we go in and there's a little shop inside with trinkets and stuff. And we had about a 20 minute wait. So we're in there and this group of black men walked in a singing quartet and they had on these jackets with shiny things on them. And there was their name. I forget what their name was, but I said, Oh my gosh, who are you guys? And they said, Oh, we're a singing quartet. We just performed at a, a local church. And I said, well, oh my gosh, we have about 20 minutes here. And I said, um, why don't you sing a song for us? 
so I'm bringing back the camera so I can tell you this last part. So I'm standing there and I go, sing us a song. So the man takes out of his shirt a little harmonica and he goes, hmm. And all of a sudden they all start snapping their fingers and tapping their feet. And I swear to you, out of all of the songs, out of all the hymns that they could have sung at that point in time, for me, you won't believe it. I'm gonna play it for you and I hope you can hear it on here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with you and I want you to listen for one word in this song. Okay, I'm gonna share it. And it's the quartet singing a song about ring those golden bells. And I hope you can hear the word that I'm talking about. Now listen. Can't you hear? Can't you hear the angels sing? Well, it's the glory. It's the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jubilee. 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 In that ball. In that ball. Sweet forever. Just be on. Just be on the side of the river. Oh, when they ring. When they ring. serve and that's the God I follow. I pray you'll follow him too. He's trustworthy and we give him all the glory. Praise God. I'll see you next week.